So what I will do is, uh, we'll just give you a brief overview of what IBD is, and at the same time looking at the current options, how we are treating IBD right now, and what we are likely to look at the coming one or two years, new changes that will take place in the management of inflammatory bowel disease. IBD is not a single disease, it's a, it's a huge thing, it's a vast area. On one side, Crohn's disease, and the other side is ulcerative colitis. And somewhere in between you have what we call as indeterminate colitis. And now with more and more surgeries over the years in people with IBD, so there's an element of pouchitis. So my focus in this talk would actually be on UC. Uh, I will not be discussing the options because then it will become a huge and a very vast area to uh, talk about. But of course, any queries will take up during the question and answer session. Just a brief uh, one slide about clinical presentation, how people come to us with UC is basically bloody mucoid diarrhea. So they have history of diarrhea, that means either an increased frequency or an increased fluidity of the stools with the element of blood and mucus. And if the disease is more severe, then of course you will have different systemic symptoms from abdominal pain to fever, nausea, vomiting and anorexia. And a decent percentage of people, they do have extra intestinal manifestations. And how we diagnose uh, ulcerative colitis, clinical history is always very important. That is classically if someone is bleeding per rectum along with diarrhea, generally of some duration. In a very acute phase if someone comes, one always thinks about infective colitis. But if the history weeks runs into weeks, then ulcerative colitis becomes an important possibility. Regarding the investigations, if you say something which is really categorical in uh, either in blood tests or stool, two things which have come up very lately as an important test. In stool, what we call as fecal calprotectin levels. It was done in the West for the past decade or so, but in India this is now available with most of the admin and big labs to differentiate IBD from IBS, that's irritable bowel syndrome. And the other thing which Dr. Malhotra rightly highlighted in the blood investigations is the role of CRP in differentiating inflammatory from non-inflammatory conditions. And even in the acute inflammatory phase, assessing the response to therapy. So CRP has come as an important tool for us. About imaging, barium enema is nowadays more or less out because of the availability of colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy, there's hardly any role which is left for performing barium enema. Plain X-ray abdomen still is very important, more so in people presenting with severe acute colitis, especially one wants to be sure that if there is any evidence of toxic dilatation of colon. So if you see in this film, the film on the... So one side you see the transverse colon which is dilated and the size is more than 6 centimeters. On the other film you see cecum which is more than 8 centimeter in diameter. So plain x-ray still carries an important role in people presenting with severe acute colitis. But the cornerstone of diagnosis now resides with a colonoscopy or at least a sigmoidoscopy in people who are acutely ill. This is the just few of the endoscopic photographs for the audience to become aware. This is just a normal colon, where it's a normal mucosa, which shows a nice vascular pattern. And what happens once ulcerative colitis sets in, there is vascular pattern gets lost, you have an erythema, you have erosions coming up, and this is actually a case of mild ulcerative colitis. There are a few areas which look quite normal, and few areas which are showing abnormality. And in this film, if you see, this is maybe a moderate ulcerative colitis. You have certain ulcers scattered along with erythematous mucosa and erosion with granularity. And as the disease goes on, you have in this multiple linear ulcers which are becoming confluent. And if the picture you see on your right side, they are in fact the only tiny islands of mucosa are left. And rest of the mucosa and submucosa, they are sloughed off. So this is classically what we find in more severe or a fulminant form of ulcerative colitis. 
And colonoscopy is a single important test which gives you so many things from diagnosis to tissue by mucosal biopsies to even extent and severity. And this helps in planning your line of treatment in such patients of ulcerative colitis. And this is just one picture to differentiate UC from Crohn's disease. If you see here, the ulcers are more fissured ulcers. They are serpiginous, communicating with each other, and this is a classical cobblestoning of mucosa. And one more line to add, previously there was a belief that we do not see Crohn's disease. And I talk a number of times that if some student makes a diagnosis in his MBBS or MD examination of Crohn's disease, most likely he'll be failed because the examiner used to say this is purely a Western disease. So whatever I would see in India is only you see and no Crohn's disease. So this is an absolute misconception. It was possibly a misdiagnosis on our parts when so much of Crohn's disease in the past was erroneously labeled as tuberculosis or some other condition. So Crohn's might not be as common as in the West, but still we see a good number of patients and it's closely approaching the number of patients we see for ulcerative colitis in India. So, so this will be one carry home message. So always suspect Crohn's disease in people with a chronic history, which is a diarrhea, abdominal pain, some fistulization, or some other complications. Ulcerative colitis, again I told about colonoscopy. This is all you should be aware because this will help you ultimately guide your people for the right treatment. The uh, classification depending upon the extent of disease. If the disease is confined to rectum, that's called proctitis. Here the treatment will be a little different from if it is left-sided or a more extensive or pancolitis. And then I'll just pass these are the different severity criteria. And before I move on to the current treatment options, the most important thing would be to just understand in two or three slides what happens in people, why certain people they go on to develop inflammatory bowel disease, what goes haywire compared to a normal individual. Because even in normal people, there's a state of controlled inflammation in the bowel. So if we do a normal mucosal biopsies, even in colon, in people who look apparently healthy and mucosa is fine on colonoscopy, still will find a, some degree of inflammation, mild to moderate lymphoplasmicity. So this is basically because of the constant exposure of mucosa to so many antigens, which could be dietary antigens, to free radicals, to even microbial antigens. But normal individuals, there's a very delicate balance between the pro and the anti-inflammatory mediators, which because of one or the other reason, in people of IBD, the pro-inflammatory mediators that predominate over the anti-inflammatory, so there's actually a switch in favor of the pro-inflammatory mediators, converting a controlled inflammation into an uncontrolled inflammation. And that's what uh, we've seen, that if you see in the center, uh, so if you see, this is the, just the normal mucosa, so where you have a tight intracellular junctions between the epithelial cells, which are called the mucinous layer. So any of those antigens which are able to breach this mucosal barrier and go into the lamina propria, lamina propria has a lot of those cells which act as the antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells <coughs> or the macrophages. And once those antigens come and bind, these cells they get activated. And the key mediator in inflammation even the bowel, like you heard in the vascular circulation, is nuclear factor kappa B. So this is the predominant inflammatory mediator now. And this sets a cascade of release of inflammatory mediators, TNF-alpha, IL-1, 6, 12, 2. So these are number of mediators which then perpetuate this whole cycle of inflammation. So this I think it's gone through. But why this is more important to understand would be that how the current treatment options they act. So if you see, so this is a pyramid which has the base as the five ESAs, the broadest part, which means the majority of the people will possibly receive this drug. And as you go up the ladder, there is 
corticosteroids, the immunomodulators, biological agents, and surgery. So IBD or ulcerative colitis is as important to physicians as to the surgical specialists. And how our main important drug, 5S, is the act. They act at this level. So where the this intracellular junctions which get depleted, they help in controlling this epithelial barrier so that no more stimulation from the mucosal aspect happens. So that means they act more topically even when given orally. They are hardly absorbed in the small bowel. A major part of the 5S is they go unabsorbed into the colon and then from the mucosal aspect they act and act as a local anti-inflammatory agents. Corticosteroids are more broad-based and they are systemic anti-inflammatory agents. And even these immune modulators, as a thiopine being the most important drug, it actually acts even to an extent on nuclear factor kappa B. So producing a sort of an immune tolerance of the body uh, in patients with ulcerative colitis. And then a big number of biologics that check directly act against those inflammatory mediators, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and now lately drugs which are effective against IL-12 and IL-2. <coughs> and even there is some role of antibiotics and probiotics. So, I'll, so this slide will actually help you understand the current rational of treatment of ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis, there are two important things. Someone comes in a condition where he has diarrhea, he has bleeding, and patient is sick. So one, you want to induce remission. Remission means symptomatic relief. And the second part would be maintenance of that remission. So one, symptomatic relief is there. You want to sustain that symptomatic relief. So people who present with a mild to moderate disease, that means the stool frequency is three, four, or five. There is some blood in the stools and no toxemia. Mesalamine would be the most important drug, either given orally, or if the disease is only distal, you can only give something a topical preparation like a spurs tree or a foam-based preparation. And if the disease is moderate to severe, if you see in the central part, then you will need administration of corticosteroids to induce remission, and then you will maintain them with either mesalamine or with the thiopurine derivatives. Anti-TNF agents also can be used if people are non-responsive to corticosteroids or even if you don't want to administer corticosteroids then they can be used as a first agent for induction of remission. And in the fulminant phase then cyclosporin is one option. Anti-TNF can still be tried but still a good number of patients they will end up with colectomy during the index admission. <coughs> 